you're buying an investment property, buying with a realtor who already worked with a lot of investors. Or owns investment properties and investors. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly, because that agent will have felt the other side of consumer side, mm -hmm. all the pain points, all the yeah. sort of like, you know, nitty gritty details. So that's why we hire. Yeah. If you're buying a brand new, uh, if, if you're buying first time, you need to work with an agent who knows how to work with first time buyers. Right. Because first time buyers, their set, sets of questions are very detailed. Mm -hmm. And so be able to communicate that, be able to make them understand that, be able to make them understand, hey, we're in a tough market, we have to pay X, Y, and Z, or don't pay above this line, the type right. of guidance. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. Welcome to episode 26 of the Realize Gains podcast. I'm your co-host, Jordan Lee. Uh, I'm an Oregon-based mortgage lender licensed in about seven states, and uh, I invest in single-family residences. Yeah, and I'm Stephen Trent. I'm an Oregon realtor. I invest in multifamily and short-term rentals. And uh, Jordan, who did we have on today? Oh, man, we had a great episode today. We, we interviewed Sean Yu, uh, who's been a realtor for about 14, 15 years in the area. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, English is a second language. He came here from Korea, and so he tells, yeah, he tells a good story. Yeah, no, I loved hearing about him starting his own uh, real estate company, mm. and also just you know his experience with helping out first-time home buyers. Yeah, he's he's really set up a good niche for himself with first-time home buyers. So if you're a first-time home buyer or you would like to work with first-time home buyers, this episode's for you. Yeah, don't forget to like and subscribe. Hey guys, welcome to the Realize Gains podcast. I'm Stephen Tran. And I'm Jordan Lee, your co-host here, and we have a really special guest today. We're here with Sean Yu. Um, hey, Sean, do you mind just giving us a quick introduction, telling us your story? Yeah. Where you're from, how you got started? Yeah, so, uh, hi, my name is Sean Yu, and I've been selling real estate since 2008, when everybody was like leaving the industry. <laughs> I'm like, oh, do 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 do. I just didn't know anything, got the license and got in. I uh, started at Windermere office and then Keller Williams in this office since like 2010 until 2019. And then I opened my own brokerage called the Sean Realty in 2019. So yeah, I've been selling for about 14 years. I know one or two things about real estate. Well, what were you doing before real estate? So I was more of a, I mean, I came to the United States when I was in the mid 20s. So I um, did, you know, grocery clerk, Produce clerk, so I know about produce. Nice. And um, I did house painting. Your painter, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I went to uh, the, the uh, Portland school, uh, Portland State for the uh, jazz and competition for a few years. So it's music is my thing. So that was the original reason you came over was to go to PSU, or uh, no? I actually came here to go to Berkeley College of Music. Okay. Um, I got accepted and everything. Got a little bit of scholarship, uh -huh. but. That didn't quite work out because when I realized how expensive it is, right. <laughs> at the time, like, you know, studio in a basement in, in Boston next to Berkeley was like 900 bucks and it's like half basement. Oh, man. I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. I'm not going to medical school. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that's, that's my story. Does that, yeah, is that enough or do you want to hear, well, it's boring. Let's talk about other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's super interesting because there's there's plenty of folks out there who are thinking about transitioning into real estate. Uh, yeah. Um, and they're just, you know, everyone likes to hear kind of how, and then like does do skills from other fields transfer over, right? Because real estate's a very um, broad mm. field mm -hmm. where, you know, you could, there's lots of different ways of, there's not one type of realtor, right? Well, well, let me just ask, like, you know, yeah. it was 2008. This is like right when the crash was happening. What yeah. made you think like, that, oh, yeah, this is a great time to do this? I, I, I didn't have that kind of th thinking process. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, oh, I'm painting houses. I may as well sell them. <laughs> I'm like, mm. so we, we were, uh, you know, my wife was working for a realtor, uh, a uh, oh, okay. realtor. So she was doing admin work and we saw how much money she was making and we kind of got to know about the real estate, you know, so. Um, it was like a backup plan. Let's get the license in mm. case things don't work out. 
and she, she kind of you know pushed me to get the license and that was a good idea oh interesting um so yeah i mean that's pretty much it but then when i got in i started learning about i was actually talking to a loan officer y- yesterday you know english is my second language right so it was really intimidating to think that i'm going to have to talk to people on the phone and negotiate and then read the contract interpret the contract all of these and then like i didn't think that i could do it when i was getting the license mm-hmm. it was more of a let's just get it and do it but it was a struggle for sure. I used to call like expired listings in this office, in that <laughs> closet, broom closet right there. Right. <laughs> for like six months and I failed mis- miserably. People couldn't, I was nervous. I was like, you know, I, I have some accent too. And sometimes it gets really thick. Mm. Accent gets really thick. Yeah, if you're tired or you're- Tired or not had coffee that day or something. But converting a cold call into an appointment was something that this company pushed me to do. So I did it six months, complete failure. Mm. No deal, spent like hundreds of hours. And then I did it again about a year after, and that might have been 2012, and then it clicked. Mm. And that's what gave me the confidence. So. You know, I think uh, if I say anybody can do it, that's a lie, I think, because it takes a lot of uh, many different skills, not just a negotiator, not just a contract reader, but you have to be good with people. Mm. You have to understand, you have to be a good communicator, good um, analyzer, home value and all of that. And then communicate with the other side of the agent. And then you need to be able to know how to do marketing. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Kind of like, you know, I mean, dentists can make mm-hmm. enough money. They can hire a marketer or, you know, buy a book of business from somebody else. True. But in real estate, that can happen for somebody who is retiring. But in the beginning, you have to build a book of business on your own. So um, for those who are thinking about jumping into business, I think um, if you jump in right now, you'll be similar to when I jumped in in 2008. Mm. So... When I jumped in 2008, like I said, I didn't know anything. Market crashed. People were like leaving the industry. And uh, I think there was some data like every day, like 10 people leave or more. Uh, but if you get in in the down market, it I think it gives you a different perspective of what to do and how to actually make it happen. Mm-hmm. Rather than in, let's say, 2015, 16, 17, when everything was just... Before you put the sign, like for sale sign, on is sold. (laughs) And you don't get to learn like ins and outs and details of the marketing, the copyright and pricing and doing open houses, all these things. um, You get to learn it the way when it doesn't sell that fast, Mm. when it sells too fast. So in my, based on my experience, it might be tough, but if you're thinking about getting, it's better to get in when it's tough. In, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Well, speaking of tough, let's yeah. let's go back to what you talked about. You said you were doing cold calls. It was really hard for you for six months. Mm-hmm. You took a year. What what changed in that year that flipped it for you and you were able to convert after mm. a year? Was it a mentality switch or what what changed for you? Mentality is big. Mm. Uh, you, you hear that, but it sounds cliche, but mm-hmm. it really isn't. Um, It really makes you like, you have to become that person first, I think. Uh, Be, do, and have, I think, what they teach in, you know, bold class here in Keller Williams. Mm -hmm. I don't promote Keller Williams, by the way. (laughs) I do like Keller Williams for new agents, by the way, because of the training programs. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I don't want to say other brokerages, but as far as I know, K-Dub has one of the best... um, best uh, training programs in my opinion mm, yeah um, so going back to what was your question yeah the mindset what clicked um, yeah I mean what changed because you said the first six mm-hmm. months you were doing it it was really hard weren't converting anything but then a year later you were having a lot of success for it yeah I think combination of things me becoming me and be more confident mm-hmm. and 
understanding <clears throat> ins and outs of the pain point of the sellers, and then understanding that I have accent and I'm okay with it. Right. And I wouldn't get nervous about it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that comes with uh, confidence and just doing it. And then the necessity part too, I had to make money. Right. So um, at that time, I tried door knocking too. Uh, okay. And that wasn't for me. I just don't like walking that much in a hot summer. <laughs> I, remember, I remember doing it with Lori in this office uh, in North Portland. I was like, ah, oh, you know, I just can't do it. I just can't do door knocking. Mm. But... At that time, cold calling, especially expired, seemed better to me because, um, I'll be honest with you, it's uh, <laughs> expires. They don't really pick up the call that often. Right. So I start, I ended up making like leaving messages and th things like that. I didn't like to talk to the uh, for sale by owners. Mm. They had certain attitude. They have certain like you know stigma, and it's like. I didn't like it, but expired. Once you get to talk to them, they're in pain. So I'm like, it was easier for me to understand and really try to figure that out and provide the troubleshooting. So that's why it clicked. And, you know, I stopped doing that, but I need to do it again in some fashion because there are people who are out there need good agents' help. And um, it's just good practice, I think, for any realtors. But that was for me, for sure. So you kept that as a, a good portion of your business. Mm -hmm. And and what what would that look like? I mean, were you making calls for three, four hours, two no. hours a day, one hour a day? or Maximum two. Okay. And uh, some days one, some days none. Uh, but follow-up is one of the key, key thing, I think, which I can't, I tend to be very unorganized at times, but I have to force myself. Hey, you got to work your database, follow up at least one hour a day. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, things are not, people are not being ignored. Right. And uh, I'm, you know, the, the more age you, you know, the older you get, you tend to forget people. Mm -hmm. I'm really good with people, face and names. Right. But even for me, certain buyers are being left out because I don't think about them. So that's my fault. I shouldn't be doing that. So yeah, that's where. So yeah, going back to, um, am, am I diving in too deep? Here? No, no, this is great. Okay. <laughs> I don't want this to be like too, too long. But so I think the mindset, the skill set, uh, and being in the right environment, people, a lot of people, and I follow certain coaches nationally, not like paid services, but there are a lot of free stuff out there. Tom Ferry. Tom Ferry, you know. Yeah. Uh, my favorite guy is actually Greg Harrelson out of uh, South Carolina, mm. Mur Myrtle Beach, I think. Um, he is with another brokerage, but I like his approach. I like his uh, personality, the way he talks kind of speaks to me. Mm -hmm. And so I try to watch when it, whenever he post like podcasts or something like that. Uh, I like Tom Ferry. I used to listen to a lot of Gary Keller's, uh, the video, the audio recordings, those are great. And Greg Harris was interviewing with Gary Keller at one of the episodes and I'm like, I was hooked. Uh, but I think that's um, important for, even for experienced agents too. Since the, since the COVID happened, that two years seems to be like in a blank space that meeting people was so forbidden and I was so in like getting used to being in the house mm. like at first when we came out to go to party like your party you know a few, few weeks ago that was probably the biggest party I went to and at first I'm like you know little you know cautious I'm already introvert in some sense right but, Kind of lost that soft skill set of being able to just yeah. interact naturally with people. Yeah, and I was talking to uh, Sam uh, Sam Cho, uh, other mortgage officer, yesterday, that I have to bring up my energy level. That's the other other difference. Mm. When you get a call, you know, oh hey, uh, hi, my name is Sean, and you know, the, it's like they're like, bye. Yeah. <laughs> 
Hey, my name is Sean. How are you doing? I'm just da, da, da. just bring up the energy. No matter what the script is, like you bring up the energy, and people like high energy. I think. Mm, yeah. So, like, depending on people, I need to basically my energy level is normally like this: very low, calm. You know, very even keel. Even keel. When I drink coffee, it does that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but when I talk to like Jordan, like if I talk to you, I bring it up here. Right. If I talk to, let's say, Chris in this office, I probably have to bring it up here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If I talk to, like, I don't know, Greg Harrelson, I'll have to bring it here. So, but that's where you tend to get a better communicating sort of environment because everybody has different energy level. Mm. And that's something I learned too. And so on the, on the phone, I kind of try to match that, right? We, we call it the mirror match. Mm -hmm. So we try to do, do that. And so... There are multiples of things, but you know, when one day uh, two of the sellers call me on the same day, uh, Sean, we want to hire you after like interviewing, like uh, against six agents, and the other one it was like more than ten. <laughs> so same day, I think it was on Friday. They both sellers called me on the same left me message and said, Sean, we want to hire you. I'm like, wow, that was the day for, for me. Like, oh, it works. Mm. It doesn't have to, I don't have to feel intimidated. I was able to be, beat out on the top agents in town. Um, and, I, you know, one time I was there, I walk in, there's another guy waiting behind me, another agent. Oh, wow. And uh, <laughs> I'm like untying shoes and uh, the owner goes, you have, you have 10 minutes. I have another appointment after you oh, and more. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. Am, am I like the last? Uh, am I like the first one or no? No, you 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 were like sixth. <laughs> 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 so you know, <laughs> and she's like, "Do you want to see the house first, or you want to talk first? I'm like, "Let's see the house." So we, we did a quick tour, three minutes. I'm like, "I'm checking my time," and she just cut to the chase. So why should I hire you? Yeah. And I had probably a minute or two to mm -hmm. you know capture mm -hmm. that. And I said what I needed to say, and then like, and then the bell rings, so I had to leave. <laughs> but that was one that I got. Okay. Can you tell us what that spiel was, or you want yeah. your secret away? <laughs> no, no, no. It's not the elevator not, pitch, right? Elevator pitch, yeah. So it's I was being genuine. I, I let me kind of trace back. Um, I think I said something in this line, you know, because I care about my clients, I find ways to make it happen. So for the expired listing owner, that was good enough, I guess. And um, I guess just I was just sincere enough that they felt it. Yeah. And I didn't have to bring out the marketing piece. I didn't have to sell. It was like, I didn't think that I had much chance mm -hmm. because I was new at it. And they were like, what? I'm one of uh, 20. So, or maybe a dozen. But um, yeah. So after that, um, I did quite a bit. But then now I'm thinking, I'm kind of bringing it back to make some expired calls because not only because they need help, but it's good for my sharpening my game. Yeah. Um, and good for, good for kind of practicing that because our job as realtor, we have to be uh, able to like turn that on. Mm -hmm. Turn it on when there's need. Somebody call. You gotta turn it on. Oh right? yeah, you gotta be professional. Yep. You gotta smile just, on and oh, the yeah. energy and yeah. Oh yeah, and I'm I'm good. I'm smile. Hello, you know. <laughs> so you gotta give that confidence because people, uh, we're gonna talk about the first time buyers, but people need our not just confidence but friendliness, professionalism, and the data that they need help on. And I was coming over here and thinking. If I'm buying a house in some somewhere in Boston where it's like it's an attorney state, not a not an escrow state, right? I wouldn't represent myself because I understand the negotiation portion of it. I understand the value of it. I know what good homes are, but I don't really know how that state, the uh, the logistics, the technical, uh, the contract, how it's written, all of that is like I don't even know. Right. So I wouldn't know uh, the earnest money, you know, return policy, refund policy. 
I wouldn't be able to protect myself. Mm -hmm. Even knowing all the ins and outs of real estate in Oregon, in Boston, I'm just a investor type, not but not quite understanding the uh, the, the uh, logistic, the legality of the real estate transaction side of it. So, I would probably hire a realtor who's experienced there mm -hmm. to work with me. And so, yeah, that's uh, something I do want to share today. But so far, we've been talking to uh, potential realtors here. Mm -hmm. So, where do you want to take it from here? <laughs> no, I do want to hear about. Well, I do want to hear about your first time home buyers. Yeah, and you know, like, what do you think about that, and how you basically. Like, what is your pitch around that? Yeah, it seems to be a focus of your business. Um, so where, where, how do you, A, like, find them, mm -hmm. and B, what what sort of, like, value, I guess, do you bring? What, why do you like first-time home buyers? Why do they mm -hmm. tend to work with you? Um, yeah, they tend to work with me. I'm not, I'm, I'm yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, my personality shows as, um, Somewhat calm. Mm, yeah. That's what a lot of agents, uh, the clients tell me, mm. that I'm calm, kind, and very nice words. But I think that's where I may, I may give less commission breath in some sense. Um, I do have commission breath. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we all want, you know, we all want transactions. We sure. all want money. But beyond that, I think it's more important that I, I um. Uh, I keep that energy, I suppose, and um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I I I like first-time buyers because they're like, they're like, um, they're in a boat in the ocean, in the middle of ocean without a guide, mm -hmm. so they don't know where they're gonna go. They could sink too, in worst cases, but they don't have any direction, and they could land on some small island and think that it's like a continent or something. So <laughs> you need a guide. So that's why I like to be able to offer what I've, what I've accumulated so far, what I know, I can share that, mm. and that can change the trajectory of well-being financially, buying the home in the right price, home is healthy, and uh, so that they can do well. So it's... To me, it's more than just a house, and it's more of a, I'm helping a family uh, to do well in their life because they live there all day long, right? right, For 10, 20 years, and buying the home right, right home at the right price and the right location will set them apart to do well in their life. So it's like a more of a holistic approach of, uh, you know, like health coach sort of thing, but... Mm. I like that quite a bit, and um, instead of just going for the the most expensive house they they can afford, oh you yeah, care I'll, more about the setting them up for future success. Yeah, I'll be telling them not to buy too expensive homes if it's a uh, first home. Mm. I mean, I unless they have like double income, they're making like a million dollars a year. Go buy anything you want. I'll right. be happy to find you the you know luxury home. But you know, uh, typical. Um, average salary person or even you know tech people uh, they make good money but i still believe that the first home should be really somewhat modest and home so that they can maybe turn to an investment or at least have that option yeah i remember yeah. you talking about that with me once before and when we were working with a client together and, and you mentioned something about looking yeah what what do you look for in a house a first time home if you're maybe eventually going to convert it into a rental mm -hmm. yeah so e easiest way is like I put the the uh, renters cap on, mm -hmm. and I go in and say, would I rent this house at the the market rate? Right. So if it's like three two single family, I say, would I pay two thousand dollars for this house to rent this one? Or not nowadays like twenty five hundred, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, that pretty much answers everything. Location. If it's a busy road, I don't want to live on a busy road. If it's a super slope, I don't want to live there because it's hard to walk around, um, not safe with the kids. Um, if the yard is super slope, would I want that? I have that now because I didn't care about yard in my own home. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think understanding that um, if my kids are really young right now, I think I'll look at certain homes in a certain way. But then are there any like uh, things that are going to cost a lot of money down the road for the maintenance portion of it? Mm. And I look at that. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like 
one sort of like side note is like 1999 homes. Mm. They're kind of tricky one. Okay. Because they are, they appear to be a newer home, but it's been about 20 or well, three years. Right. Yeah. Things are going to fall apart. Yeah. Roof's going to be replaced soon probably. Yep. I mean, you never know how old the water heater is. Maybe there you go. Maybe at least once. The second time is probably coming up. Exactly. And so, you know, that's where... Those are the things that your realtor, experienced realtor, will tell you. And I, I, and I like understanding that. I like to give that kind of value to the first-time buyer. And they tend to come back when they buy their move-up home. Mm. Oh, yeah. And right? you can also say it, too. Like, those homes in the 90s, like, they generally have bigger lots than the new construction after 2000. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, for sure. So it's like you'll have these roof problems and this maybe, and hopefully right. you can get it fixed or, you know, during an inspection or get some credit. But if you move her to a newer modern house, like you have barely a yard, so that's the trade-off. Yeah, yeah. The, the the newer homes, you know, Koreans. I'm Korean. Yep. So Koreans love brand new homes. Yeah. I'm I'm I basically tell them like pretty much every time like, do you really want brand new home? Do you really need to buy it? <laughs> um, but you know, I basically tell them brand new homes tend to lose the. Uh, the value, the resale value in the first like three years, it seems always because the builders do charge quite a bit yeah. because it's brand new. So it has that, you know, buying new car effect in the first two years, maybe. It, the price is up here, you buy it at the peak and then it kind of drops and then it comes back again. So uh, I don't recommend it for people who might have to move in the next three to five years, maybe, to buy brand new homes. Mm -hmm. Um, because of it, but anyways, that's I'm kind of getting into two two uh, details of it. But yeah, so I like first time buyer. I like helping them out. I like setting them up. And now I understand that the investment portion of it and having an option to turn the primary home into an investment home down the road can actually set them apart so much better. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm like advocating. It's just try to buy something that's really modest. You can rent really well, three bedroom, two bath in a decent location. You know, condition is okay as long as there's no main, uh, the major maintenance issue. Right. Just buy something, you know, be reasonable and that will make you really rich. I, I even tell them you can retire like 10 years sooner <laughs> if oh, yeah. you have a few of those. Mm -hmm. But again, it's one of those things you could, uh, how do you say, say that? Bring the horse to the water, but they, you, you can make them drink. Right, you can't make them drink. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. You right. just say, right? Uh, so kind of like that. Yeah. So the buyers have to understand where they come from, understand the investment side of it, and then they send, you know. So uh, it is challenging, but I do spend some time to make them understand that at least to have that option. So giving all the options, they're the ultimate decision makers, but as long as I show them my options, recommend the top two, three choices for what I think is the best options, I've done my job. Yeah. Right. I was going to say, like, you know, you definitely don't give off commission breath when you tell them to keep their home instead of selling their home. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. 100%. Yeah. Well, but, and right now, I think there's a great opportunity for that. I'm noticing that with some of my, some of my clients that are, you know, my age that have bought homes in the last seven, you know, 10 years. Mm -hmm. They bought it at, with a low rate. They have a ton of equity. Um, so they're thinking about moving up. And it's a perfect time to be converting it into a, a rental because, you know, their monthly payment might be a little bit more more affordable. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so let's run a number, hypothetically, that, that your friend, you know, bought seven years ago, uh, bought a home at like $450,000 home. Okay. That could probably could have been somewhere in the, oh gosh, 2,500 square feet, maybe close to 3,000 depending on the neighborhood. But that one wouldn't be a great investment mm. because now that is worth about 650 to 700. Right. And the rental that you're going to get might be about close to 3,000. It may cash flow, so it could actually be an investment, but... Um, the higher the square footage, less opportunity to rent out because yeah. there are less buyers. And so, um, but if they bought something at that time, like two, uh, 300 ish. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. People that bought like townhomes or whatever, right. they're in that 250 to 300 range. 
that have appreciated nicely. I have yep. one client that's in that exact situation right now. Right? Yeah. So that one could be anywhere between like four to maybe four fifty right mm -hmm. now. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. The value, the if rental. They need to take a HELOC from that. They can. Yeah. Yep. Rental. So rental rate and then the the mortgage payment and the house payment can kind of like match. Yep. So th those are good investments. So if somebody bought a bigger home uh, for the first one, there could be some other options. So if you want to keep that home, you may be able to find the different spaces to kind of separate that ADUs, mm. like additional dwelling units and kind of rent out separately. Or if it is a big lot, maybe building other structure could be a potential. But within what you have, be able to like maximize the spaces to rent out uh, could be a good option. But you know, that's where, um, yeah, I mean, buying right in the beginning was really important. Yeah, so. Yeah, and I think for first time home buyers, it's really actually hard to <clears throat> imagine mm -hmm. what what's gonna be in your life. Like when I bought my home in 2012, mm -hmm. I had no idea what, like, I was like, oh yeah, I'm probably just gonna live here for 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think it, it, yeah, it can really help to have an expert that will kind of give give you a guide. Yeah, it help you to think about, well, you know, maybe in five years, like you might have a kid, and you might you need know, to get a bigger you home. Might need a bigger home. <laughs> you might need to live in a better neighborhood, better mm -hmm. schools, different school district. Yeah, you know. Uh, so I, I think that's that's an important thing to keep in mind when you're buying your first home. Like, oh, you, yeah. do, you doesn't necessarily have you don't necessarily have to love it. Um, you, you might think about it more from an investment longer term perspective. Yeah, yeah. And so that's where I think it's really important. Right now, what's happening is um, a lot of young people, you've probably seen enough of them too. They have some school debt, mm -hmm. but the price is like taking off with a not as you know inflated salary. Buying a home as a professional single is not easy. Mm. And so that's where right now I, I'm dealing with some um, first-time buyers. Some are actually thinking about like roommate situation. Mm, yep. So they have a friend who's uh, thinking about renting a room from them. Mm -hmm. And I have a friend actually doing it right now. No, nice. Yeah. So be able to, you know, uh, offset the cost, but have that uh, the friend to pay some portion of the house payment. And in the meantime, you can get into the ownership. Right. So you can head start basically. Yeah, and they now have loan products that will use that income to help you qualify. I mean, some of them are income dependent, but uh, mm -hmm. which is which is really nice. So yeah, order income as as we like to refer to it in the mortgage order world. Income. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's that's something I would think that is so much better. And I was thinking even I haven't done anything like this, but you know, gathering some friends and, and do a co-owned pur purchases. Mm. I mean that that's possible, right? Yeah, I, right? right. Yeah, I joint joint tenant. Yeah, ten, tw tenants in tenants common. In common. Yeah. Two of the two of the properties that I own, I I bought with a partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're just both we own it fifty fifty. Basically, yeah. we're both on the loan. We're both on the title. Right, and that's a message I think needs to go out there to young people because I I don't like seeing like a black rock like a hedge fund buying uh, hundreds of homes in Houston, Texas, the whole subdivision, oh, yeah. to turn it into a rental neighborhood. That's wrong. I used to work for BlackRock. You did? <laughs> yeah. As, so, a, as a software engineer. Oh. <laughs> That's why I left. <laughs> really? Yeah. So what do you think about that? Oh, no. They're... Oh, can I say it on camera? Oh, sure. I think they're totally evil. <laughs> you know, that's I couldn't. I didn't invest in them. I never bought their stock. I never did anything. I just worked for them, and uh, I think they're a totally evil company. But whatever. <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't work for them anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, so I think buying... yeah, the single family home used to be the non corporate investment, right? That yeah. used to be like the little man's investment. Yeah. Can Can I pull this back so I sure. can kind of see both? I'm like my head head is like yeah. I'll stay here. Uh, so what were you saying? No, just that. To your point about like corporate investors buying whole subdivisions, that I mean that wasn't the case, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Right. It wasn't nearly as popular. I mean, the single family home was always kind of like the mom and pop investment. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's where opportunities are taken away. Yeah. And price points are getting a little out of hand mm -hmm. for you know obviously first time home buyers. Yeah. You know. So how do you work with home buyers who have uh, maybe just too high of expectations with everything? Uh, I want the perfect home, perfect neighborhood, no crime, mm -hmm. quiet street. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I want that. 
I say, <laughs> I say, go talk to Steven. <laughs> Uh, bye. <laughs> no, no, I, I wouldn't. I mean, I'll try to, you know, make, make them understand the situation. I think the buyers are smart enough. Nowadays, you know, Zillow and all these websites, I mean, their, their estimates are not accurate, as we all know. Yeah. But they, the consumers have their own sort of understanding of the values. So I don't think I need to do too much of that. Because they don't see homes what they want in their price range. Yeah. So, but what I do see often is like in the beginning, they want, let's say, $600,000 home based on the monthly payment number. But then when you look at like a Bethany neighborhood for six hundred dollars for like about a month, and they realize there is not no such thing, <laughs> unless it's super fixer or something like that. Right. Yeah. And so they come to a realization, oh, maybe I do need to adjust my price. And that's where... Me as an agent, it's really hard to really guide them, but I can give them the option, but ultimately they have to make a decision because what's really more important? Sending your kids to the schools that you want to send them and they have really like nice neighborhood that you're thinking about maybe living there for 15 years and on the other side, you pay uh, $300 more a month. That's their call. So I kind of have to, but if they're super tight in the budget, then I have to kind of uh, take them take them out to a little bit more outside. Mm -hmm. They'll go out Can more you make suburb these sessions. Basically, like, are you willing to go to yeah. Loa or yeah, you know, or maybe Hillsboro. smaller one, yeah. or maybe a townhouse. Yeah, yeah, maybe one less bedroom. Maybe instead of three car, just maybe bring that down to maybe two, maybe one car garage, mm -hmm. because three car garage is hard to find to begin with. Um, so it's, you know, the way I look at it is like 70% matched home is perfect one in this market. Mm -hmm. A lot of times mm -hmm. there's no such thing as a 100%. Even you build a new, new home it, after you live there for about two months, like, oh, well, shoot, I shouldn't have done that. You know? <laughs> so there's always that, but there, I think it's location is super important. They all talk about it. So you guys know, but yeah. So, um, what other questions do you guys have? I did bring a quick uh, little summary of things for the first-time buyers. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I would love to hear it. Yeah, cool. So the first thing is, like I mentioned, it's all about having the options, whether you um, want to turn that into an investment property or whether you, want to, you live there forever mm -hmm. or whether you want to sell it and move on to something else. Buying right in the beginning is super important. That typically boils down to the price. As long as, like I said, there's no like a major issue. And when I talk about major issues, like foundation is probably one of them. Um, um, siding and roof combined could be like thirty thousand dollars to pay. Sewer, right? Or so, sewer. sewer line. Sewer is another one. Yeah, anywhere between what, like four, ten to fifteen grand. Yeah, uh, some somewhere in there. It's a sort of high range, but there's some cheaper ones too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so having that option is really important at the beginning, um, and then so it's kind of like you have to kind of adjust, like you were saying. You you need to adjust the expectation. Mm -hmm. We all want this gigantic, you know, vaulted ceilings with a huge yard, and the price like doubles after that. Um, to your point on future rental, sometimes HOAs will not allow you to rent. So uh, certain specific condos might be. Oh, uh, yeah. And not then there's rental caps options. and stuff yeah. too, and townhouses and right. condos. So. Right. So that's another big topic. But so, yeah, I mean, if there's 100 units in the condo building and 25% rent cap, it, it means only 25 units can be rented out. Mm. If you're not in that 25, you can't rent out. So it doesn't give you that option when that happens. And knowing that is important. Yeah. And so uh, condo can be a you know okay first time investment property but because of that i don't really like that product as much and i don't oh, typically yeah. recommend to my buyers i mean yeah there's a rental cap and then you know the hoa can be really expensive in a condo to kind of ruin a lot of uh yeah. cash flow but yeah. i do know some investors that only invest in condos because yeah. it's it's easy some of them are the hoas are great they just take care of everything for you right mm -hmm. and all the exterior repairs are taken care of yeah for you every month you don't have to you don't have to deal with it. Um, mm -hmm. So I've seen, I've seen You've both seen sides one. of yeah. the. I mean, I know, I just know some investors that prefer it, and some investors that I'll, I'll never pay an HOA. Right? Yeah, yeah, I know one too. Um, uh, yeah, he 
basically did that. Mm -hmm. But it's a give and take. So it's kind of like the higher risk, higher rewards type of thing. Condo is smaller risk and smaller reward. Right. So if you look at 15 years, 20 years down the road, the, the appreciation gain that you get is somewhat mediocre mm -hmm. at best. Um, so that's where... Uh, people and also people who don't have a lot of time left, meaning they're old, right? That's kind of mean way to say it. But <laughs> so if you're like in the fifties and up, uh, appreciation isn't the most important thing because the gain that you're gonna right. realize isn't that big. But it's just the stability side of it. Right. So condo can be good because it's like you don't have to do anything. They will maintain it all. Uh, it's secure, uh, so it's good. Um, but in our market is kind of different for condos i feel like too than a lot of markets there's just not a ton of supply of condos in, in our area compared to like you know certain cities in california or whatnot where mm -hmm. condos can do really well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it, it, it kind of just depends on your local market as well as exactly you know. local market is huge right now i you know i do see the portland downtown portland as opportunity because of that reason mm -hmm. right now the market is like really you know going down and because of the you know so social unrest and you know these uh, downtown issues, a home homeless population, but I do believe that it will go not completely go away, but it will get much better soon, and so I hope so. Um, and that's where you can get some decent deals, um, as long as you like the urban living, uh, you buy at the right price. Uh, the the HOA isn't too high. Uh, right now the the way I look at it is if the utility is included, I'll be okay with HOA fee up to about 400 a month. Mm -hmm. If utility is not included, I wouldn't look at anything over 300 for sure. Mm. Um, but, you know, things are changing. Um, but, yeah, condos, it's better to own a condo <laughs> than renting, that's for sure. Oh, I just wanted to switch gears a little bit. I did want to hear a little bit more about your personal uh, real estate company. Yeah. Like, you know, why did you switch out from uh, Keller Williams to building your own company? And how did that look like? And how what are the struggles in that? Oh, yeah. Um, I, you know, I like, I like Colleen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love Colleen. But, you know, Colleen is a principal uh, broker in this office. Um, I, I, I like Chris, too. But, you know, I, I like people here, too. Mm -hmm. But at some point, I wanted to build something more than... Um, just my individual real estate business. I wanted to build a small business that I could have it as my own. That always was in back of my mind. Maybe because I grew up with my pa parents who owned their own, you know, business. My mm -hmm. mom had a beauty shop. My See dad had, shop? A, yeah, my, yeah, okay, yeah, and my dad has a sub supply store. So, you know, I kind of in, in uh, Korea, yeah, yeah, in okay. Korea, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, I could have been a hair hairdresser too because I always like growing up watching my mom, you know, doing the scissor things. And I'd be probably good at it uh, if if I did it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's probably the one main reason. Um, struggle wise, uh, the things that is kind of it becomes lonelier. Yeah, <laughs> pretty fast because I have to be my own, and uh, I don't get that you know the the uh, synergy of the great office mm -hmm. like this, great people. You have a team though, right? Yeah, I, I have a I have a team uh, transaction marketing side. They're part time assistants, but they take care of a lot of things, so I don't have to focus on little details on the marketings or keeping track of time or things like that on transactions. But and then I have other uh, broker. Um, uh, in my brokerage too. Mm. Do you miss like resources like command or things that KW provides? No. You don't miss any of that stuff? No. <laughs> <laughs> don't cut that. <laughs> I don't. I waited around for EH for too, too long. I got burnt. Okay. Show this to Colleen. Or I just Colleen wouldn't care. <laughs> Hello, Colleen. <laughs> Yeah, well, so. ultimately, like what a, a spreadsheet of your database is good enough. It's like whatever you use, right? You've got your phone. You've got yeah, your email. yeah. It's uh, it's really the the tech is one of those things. It's overrated in real estate mm -hmm. because it's so based on the the trust between the client and the agent, and like human contact cannot be replaced by AI or any kind of tech. 
um, it can help bringing more like cold lead maybe. Mm -hmm. But once they, I mean, people want to talk to you, see you, Zoom you, you know, uh, we we get to drive around, you know, town in the same, same car, checking out homes. Um, I love seeing their kids like growing up on Facebook. And it's so often nowadays, like they, they're, new couple and then they have kids now and their that kid is already five years old and i haven't talked to them yet so that's my fault but that's the fun part in real estate um but yeah i mean to answer your question tech no i mean tech can help save you some time but it's not make or break type of thing in my opinion okay yeah yeah i know i mean i i only know of being on a team at kw and i yeah. don't know what it looks like to go off and do something completely without like a big structure like KW or EXP or mm -hmm. I don't know, one of the other Windermere, you know, mm -hmm. having everything around you. So that's what I'm curious about is starting your own entire company. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like a outsider. I'm outsider for sure. Yeah. It's pretty rare. Um, it's uh, the marketing is more, more fluent in a sense that it's kind of like, you know, when I promote myself, it promotes my company, vice versa. When I promote my co company, it promotes me. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, I know that it's not, it may seem too hard to make your own, but it's the perception. I, I think what I do believe in is that as a realtor, it's probably the best to be your own. Yeah. So solo agent with some team support rather than in a team environment. Un unless you're new uh, and you have to learn things, uh, it can be a good option. But you can still be a solo agent and come to a good office like this and you can learn quite well. And I'm thankful for this office actually, for the mentors. Um, some names that I think about is like, you know, Sherry Francis right there. I hear her talk. I mean, she's a great agent. Mm -hmm. um, Karna, she's awesome. Chris, Colleen, of course. And so being in an environment where you can learn from those great agents, how they treat their customers, what kind of flyers that they send out, that's important too. But, you know, like Sherry will share with me her marketing stuff with me. Yeah. So those are the things that uh, really kind of help you so that it can, you, you can start your own solo career. And then from then on, you make your own adjustments and, so yeah i mean it's uh, nothing against the teams but uh, for the better growth i believe in the solo uh so that you can see the listing and buy side both oh yeah what about the like the legal and the compliance part of that running your own business is there do you have to spend a lot of time doing that or um more than in a big company uh but you know there's eno insurance i do have the attorney that i can call to mm -hmm. uh but other than that i, I think uh what I built from other you know, previous companies, I know what to do and what not to do. And then I have certain guidelines in my moral compass where you know, those things I should not touch. And so I'm more conditioned, so I don't really have to worry too much about it. Mm -hmm. And when those moments arise, I, <laughs> I actually imagine going to Colleen's room and what she would say to me. <laughs> <laughs> and her voice, her <laughs> sentence, you know, structure, I used to say, say that one more time, Colleen. <laughs> but she would make it very clear. Um, so I learned from the best. So I feel confident about that. Hmm. But, you know, it's something that you always have to be careful. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we always ask people, like, if somebody was to get started in real estate, mm -hmm. uh, what, would, what kind of advice would you give them? Oh, somebody who's and not in the real estate? Something that's Thank someone you. that's interested in buying a home or getting their first investment property. Or just getting or, being becoming a realtor. Or becoming like, a realtor, sure, yeah. Well this is let's start with the realtor. It's yeah. like like stereo, like you're you're asking two different questions here. <laughs> cool. Uh so since you asked first, so it's yeah, about getting started in real as a realtor. Okay, yeah. Um I think it's a great ca career as long as you um um sorry. As long as you are willing to work hard. I think it's a good career because it's a pretty rewarding career. Um, but it's not easy it's not easy. Yeah. It's a very competitive market. Mm. So in my opinion, you have to be good at something, really good at so something. It's a tough question. I mean it's um since it's not really easy one, but it can be really good. 
So anything specific you're thinking? No, I mean, like, I, you know, I've, I've met a lot of great agents and some of them have wildly different strengths. Mm. You know, some of them are very emotional, very can connect with people and some of them are very analytical and very, you know, yeah. and they bring value to their people. Mm. It's just like, what do you think is the key to success uh, in becoming a realtor? You need to ask what, Colin or yeah, like, What do you wish that, what are you doing now that you wish you did or when you started anything, if you were uh, to go back and retrace, you know, what would you oh, do yeah. differently? That's a good question. Um, I would really get into the uh, the uh, routine part. Mm. Routine part is, I think, really important. Uh, setting certain goals, mm -hmm. like you know, appointment number of appointments, one month, how many you want to go to, or how many like network, like you know, networking event you you will go to. Mm -hmm. Because it's all about the human connection. So depending on how many people you know, they like you and trust you, mm -hmm. and they know you're in business, you you can start getting those businesses. Right. Um, so uh, that's probably the one thing. And it has to be, it can be very freeing, but then it can be very detrimental if you don't use your time well. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's kind of like uh, you can do nothing for three months and you're like, how? Oh, where's the business? Of course, you did nothing. You don't get any business. <laughs> and I do that too. Every once in a while, I do that often break. too. Yeah. yeah. Take a break is fine, but um, it's um, having certain like a uh, certain system is really important. And don't spend like time on like CRM like I did. I probably checked out like double, like a, like a dozen CRMs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Waste a lot of time and money and stuff. But just find something simple. Spreadsheet is awesome. Uh, just, had, you know, even I know Gary Keller used to use one of these. Mm, no he problem. would have, yeah, names and then he have a box and he would go through and, oh, I haven't called this guy. Call, you know. So those systems, um, but ultimately, uh, for the new one, I would find somewhere where you can really learn the business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's probably the... Start in an office where you, yeah. there's good mentors. Yeah. Office or a team. Team? Mm, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I, you know, I'll be honest with you. Team, one thing, one thing that I don't like is that you're limited to what you learn. So buyer's agent, for, for example, you're not going to learn anything about listings. And uh, you have to typically go showing buyer and listing agent and that steps can be great but you don't get to see the whole picture of how business is run yeah and how to like you know market a listing or how to be a great mm. buyer's agent and so to me it kind of limits but it's a good it's a decent starting point um but but then uh certain people like you said, you know, everybody has different, you know, you know, like a strength. If somebody's super good with the buyer, super friendly, they understand the buying process so well, but they don't want to do anything about business building, mm -hmm. anything about marketing. They hate marketing. That person could be a great buyer's agent. Yeah. In a team. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think, yeah. I hope that makes sense. No, it does. I mean, I think yeah. being a well-rounded agent means you have to do a lot of the things that you're uncomfortable with, you know? Yeah. Because they're very different skills being a listing agent and, you know, a buyer's agent. Yeah, yeah. And so that's where I, I think being exposed to different things is one way that solo agents can actually do. And I personally believe th this is against sort of like a Keller Williams model or, the you know, the teaching here. But when you do listing and buy both, you have a better understanding of the whole situation yep, real estate in general oh, in yeah. general yeah uh because it's um once you become the listing agent getting calls from buyer's agent about offers you know how to do better job as buyer's agent right. because you understand the listing agent's point of view yeah. mm -hmm. it, you know there are certain things as uh you know like a like uh, bringing down a property, that property sucks, man. That's why we're making this offer. That kind of things you're gonna learn really fast. Yeah, yeah. At the same time, <laughs> uh, nowadays it's like you know, is a quote unquote tough negotiators. Me as a realtor who's been doing it for a little bit, it's kind of like digging your own grave <laughs> when you're too tough to the other agent, because it's a pretty small community. Yeah. 
And so you may get a few grand more for the current your client, but you're too tough of negotiator and not pleasant to work with. The next so many deals you might suffer, meaning not just you, but your future clients. Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. So being professional, tr treating all the agents as best as you can, and you know, respect them from beginning, uh, no matter they're new or not. Um, and I think it's really important. So it's really going back to your other questions for the newer agents. I think it's really the hu human skill, the personal skill, and then uh, everything else can be learned. I think um, you have to be, you know, caring person because they need caring with both sellers and buyers. Investors, they need caring too, actually. Um, and then, you know, other skills you can learn. So let's jump into your question mm. for the buyers. If that was your question, right? Yeah, if someone's thinking about buying real estate or mm -hmm. jumping in. So yeah, I mean, we, we already established that the buying is a better way to go than renting. So, you know, saving up the down payment as soon as you can. And then... Um, Really, the um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say, or maybe you have an example of something you did, like your first place that you bought, or mm -hmm. what you wish you would have done on your oh, first time. You're going there, <laughs> so this is I a mean, that's how we learn, right? No, 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 no. I'm glad you asked. So, that's how I they gave me actually a boost on why I needed to start this career because, to, to be honest with you. My first home, oh, is it really second home in Portland? My first home was okay. My my second home uh, in Portland, in brand new city, we just moved here. Uh, we found the wrong agent. Mm. And you had just sold a home in a different city. Yeah, in, in, at, yeah, in, okay. in Minnesota. Okay. Uh, so we had some, uh, let's see, the house sold, closed. We, we packed up, we drove off that day. <laughs> Uh, so we're driving over here and talking to a loan officer and I did get a subprime loan type, uh, <laughs> because you didn't have a job at the time, right? Yeah, I didn't have a job. Yeah. So, but, uh, nothing uh, against the loan officer, but at the time they could give you a loan without showing a job. Um, so it was subprime loan. It was fixed rate. Thank God, mm. uh, but it was subprime because I, you know, the job I didn't have jobs, so I didn't have qualifications, so it's well below prime. <laughs> um, but our agent at the time basically said, you know, the house was sitting on the market for minimum six months. I, I feel like it was close to nine months not mm. selling, and we said, hey, can we make a lower price offer? Mm. The agent's answer was no. Why did they ask? No, the agent asked the listing agent if they could write it. No. Okay. She just told us. Oh, interesting. So looking back, we probably lost about 10% of that home because of mm -hmm. her. Um, so I don't know what it was, but maybe she was thinking at the time, because of the market, it was in 2005. Market was kind of hot. Yeah. Um, the Her mentality was like oh you got to make full price offer maybe she was a new agent maybe she was an agent who didn't maybe she wanted a bigger commission yeah maybe she mm, no yeah, not so. not that she wanted the deal for sure yeah but commission wise i mean 10 percent of, of a two and a half percent it's not much yeah but yeah. just so you know I what i'm saying i've seen agents want, like demand that a closing date is on a specific day so they can get paid for that month so it's uh, not, it's, to me it's not a big thing to, to get another thousand bucks or whatever or you know 500 bucks or whatever it is mm -hmm. to by mm -hmm. changing the price i i think that you know financial sort of like a scarcity could make an agent like that and, and that's the one thing that's really important for the consumers to understand that um um you know it's how do you find that good agent that was my second key point for the buyers talking mm. to pros mm. who uh who have the solutions and creativity side of it but finding the good agent is really important because I personally experienced the opposite. Mm. Yeah. And so we probably lost close to twenty to about thirty five thousand when we sold that property because we bought too high. No, you could you bought high and then you had to sell in like yeah. oh eight oh uh, eight or something. Uh, thirteen, I think. Oh thirteen, okay. We barely broke even. Yeah, yeah. So how that's how bad it was. Right. 
I should have made some money because by 13, it kind of turned around. Right, it started turning around at that point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, but I wasn't an Asian until 2005, but I could understand. I have a brain, you know. I mean, I have a basic, but I wasn't bold enough to tell that agent, how come? This hasn't been selling. Nobody's buying. Why can't I make a lower offer? That's like me coming from South Korea, just basic common sense. But, you know, that's where we were, we were vulnerable. We had young kids, no jobs, staying at friends' house. Unfamiliar with the town. Unfamiliar yeah, with the town. Didn't know the market. Yeah. We, needed, we needed somebody who can really guide us. Right. So we, we liked her, her personality. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of stuck with her and did a buying f with her. But that's a big price that we had to pay. Yeah. And so that's every day. I say, never be that agent. Mm -hmm. No matter what the situation, even I have to quit the real estate, don't be that agent. Right. So I, I can't really say her name. I don't want to say her name. But, okay. yeah. uh, you know, I, I, you tell us after you turn off the camera. No, <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, so that's, um, that's how I actually do try it. So that's probably why I feel I, I have a soft, a soft side for first time buyers. Mm. Because when you come out, come in here as a new, new uh, to town, you don't know anything. You have limited time. You're forced to buy something. Uh, you're you know scared, nervous about it. You don't know anything, and um, that's where finding an a agent who not only friendly, <laughs> that's that's like gimme I think, but knowledgeable and really caring mm. for you you as a client and then having the competency of understanding the value negotiating um so that they, they can buy the right home at the right price mm. that was a bad bad example so um but yeah i it's funny that that story never leaves and i, I i'll never forget that um but anyways yeah no, I think it's great. I mean, it's what makes you a great agent now. You know, if you didn't have that experience, so. you you wouldn't know what a bad experience looks like. What, exactly. like you know, like um, you you wouldn't you wouldn't have an example of what you shouldn't do. Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. Especially when you're in a place when you started early and you weren't making money, and we had to make basically if we don't sell a house, we don't eat. You know, mm -hmm. it's tough. But you had that experience, and obviously, you know, we're not here for. I mean, like I said, we love our commission, of yeah. course. Right. But you know, when that's your only goal you start ignoring, you know, the personal side, which is the most important side of being an agent. Yeah, so. yeah. So always have to be, what's the best for my client? What's best for my client? What's best? That has to be ingrained to be a good agent. And that's a good way to avoid any legal issues too, by the way. <laughs> you <laughs> asked that question. We are already. fiduciaries to our clients. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. I truly believe that. We, you know, it's tough when it's commission only, but we are fiduciaries for our clients. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think a good agent, we actually deserve to get like retainer fee too, in some sense. We don't charge that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, because good agents will not only save you money, but it can save your health. Knowing about, you know, rate, like rate on gas, for example, you're buying in, let's say, Northeast Portland and your agent didn't do, you know, rate on test. That could actually give you lung cancer in 20 years right um you know and then be able to see like a, a landscape that is dangerous for young kids you know they have a young kids and you find this uh, uh backyard with the big old drops i wouldn't do that right so but then that's the part that i wanted to bring this up not many people talk about this but uh, so how do you find a good agent you might ask right mm -hmm. yeah so um that's where i made a note because this is coming from different side of the view. How, not, did, not how did you find so your agent when you moved to town? Oh, so the bad one first, huh? Bad, bad example first? No, just, I mean, because it's interesting to think about how you find an agent because it's True. different for everyone. True. Oh, gosh. Um, so we didn't know where to look. So we were staying at our friend's house, house sitting. We were in Southeast Poland, Les Audition, really nice neighborhood. Mm. We couldn't find anything that we could afford there. Yeah. Uh, we start getting around. There's North Portland. There's like reasonable pricing. Yep. Um, so I think 
we might have drove by a house or something like that, or just we saw just like the a website. Sign or yeah, something. Okay. Yeah. yeah it, it was just like a website per person. We just called and she showed us a house, but she was kind of not too friendly or, you know, so. But then it didn't work out. The, the, the agent we ended up buying with that we weren't happy with, uh, we were looking in uh, the neighborhood near uh, Southwest. Uh, the Multnomah Village, uh, Multnomah, uh, what's that? The Athletic Center, I forget what it's called. Multnomah Park. Oh, the Mac? Not Mac. Uh, Multnomah Park, there is a park, a uh, dog park and stuff. Gosh, I'm forgetting the park oh, name. The Rec Center there? Multnomah the Rec Center, yeah. yeah. So, um, South, uh, Southwest Community Center, that's what they yeah. call it. Um, so, we were looking at some homes in that town because we loved the trees, you know, all the pretty hills with the cute houses, a bunch of trees. So we like Southwest at the time. And we saw one house and it was a sign call as well. Um, yeah. So that's how we found. And then she was really friendly and we just didn't look further than that. Uh, but um, I think, you know, experience is important. Mm -hmm. Because in real estate, we still learn after selling for 14 years, I still learn something new quite often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And every situation is different. So, for example, ex uh, experience. When you talk about, let's say, you know, switch your gear a little bit here. If you're buying an investment property, buying with a realtor who already worked with a lot of investors. Or owns investment properties and investors. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Because that agent will have felt the other side of the consumer side, mm -hmm. all the pain points, all the yeah. sort of like, you know, nitty gritty details. So that's why we we'll hire. Yeah. If you're buying a brand new, uh, if if you're buying first time, you need to work with an agent who knows how to work with first time buyers. Right. Because the first time buyers, their set, sets of questions are very detailed, mm -hmm. and so be able to communicate that, be able to make them understand that, be able to make them understand, hey, we're in a tough market, we have to pay X, Y, and Z, or don't pay above this line that type right. of guidance right. mm -hmm. so that's really important so the experience really comes in this isn't really to bash you know new newer agents but uh there's a lot so mm -hmm. when everything goes well fine but there's chance that uh the new agents can do a great work too, as long as they're diligent, they really care enough to get all the answers from their experienced agents in the office, or have a great principal broker who can really guide. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's more conditions to be, uh, to have the transaction in the correct way. So it's kind of like can be really dangerous. So that's one thing I would ask if I'm interviewing agents, uh, five years or more would be probably what I would go with. Uh, I hope this is okay with... Uh, <laughs> no, it's fine. You can just also write, just call Stephen Tran. Yeah, Stephen yeah. Tran. <laughs> <laughs> I just said, saw him for the second time. He's usually like nice guy. Oh, He's a nice you. guy. But, <laughs> but there's more than that, obviously, than, you know, being just nice. We'll see. We'll see. Um, and, um, you know, other part is that uh, sort of like willingness and caring part. Mm. And that's where... Somebody who has to have some compassion that goes back to your questions about uh, thinking about becoming a realtor. Mm -hmm. If you're a compassionate person and care about other people's well-being and you know a little bit less uh, selfish, that's probably one great quality that you can have. Uh, whether that kind of spews out of your body or just internal, but that's kind of like a core thing because you, like you say, we are we are fiduciary, and without the caring portion. Um, it's not going to be great. Yeah, I yeah. totally agree. I mean, you can sell 300 homes a year uh, with just turning, you know, lease after lease. And, but uh, yeah, I don't think uh, there would be a, you know what I'm saying? So you have to have some caring sign. Yeah. 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 Um, and then the, because we have many different moving parts in real estate, being creative is really important. Mm find ways to, find to solution, yeah. solutions yes yeah. so for example the investment side of it uh, can you see the creativity way to like convert the garage mm -hmm. and put a kitchen in there mm -hmm. ideas like that doesn't come just you know un unless you read the books all the time but the creativity is really important so 
me as a guitar player, if you find a guitar player realtor, hire them. <laughs> because, because guitar players have different brain. We have this very improvisational sort of brain that, um, hmm, you know, any musical instrument players will have uh, more creativity, in my opinion. Mm. Uh, that's a side note. But so those things are what I would look for. Once you have the right realtor, everything else can just fall apart, uh, fall into places mm. really well. And they're, they're, we're like a quarterback, right? Mm -hmm. We're like the quarterback moving pieces, you know, setting the mortgage, escrow, and be able to come in with other parties. And we keep, the, keep track of time. We do the inspection, negotiation, all of these things, uh, and yet give the final decision to the buyers. So... Probably once you find the right realtor who's caring, capable, competent, and willingness and creativity and all of that combined, I know it seems like a lot, but and go with your gut feelings too after you fed it. You know, I would definitely talk to at least three agents if I was a buyer, mm. because three people could have. Very same quality, caring, everything is great. They all play guitars. <laughs> Out of these three, one person could really communicate well with you. Mm -hmm. So finding the match is su super important too, I think. Yeah. That's kind of what I always advise. I, I want them to have the right personality to vi vibe, I guess, so mm -hmm. that, yeah, the communication flows easily. Yeah, yeah. That's really important, I think. And especially when there's like a language barrier. So I speak I speak Korean. And so people who don't speak English fully, having that native tongue is huge too. Mm -hmm. uh, and they come from different culture where a lot of like pocket list things happen in South Korea. So it's different. Right. But yeah, that's really important. Um, and then other than that, oh, so... Before I jump into the other questions, what should we cover? Am I talking too I, much? I think we've covered all of our stuff. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Oh, continue. Yeah. Feel free. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, talking about the options, when you buy a home, let's say with a two car garage in one level, I sometimes really tempted to co convert that garage to another living space mm. because garage is, I'm, I have kind of, we're thinking about the car fume inside of the garage. I just saw a brand new home, the noise build. They put a fan in the garage. I'm like, what is that for? Mm. And she's like, oh, yeah, that's to uh, uh, fan out the fume mm. inside of the garage. And mm. so um, I prefer to leave my car outside personally. <laughs> but, um, so having that options of maybe modeling, updating, putting addition, maybe separating, putting another bathroom, and those things can be really... So when you look at a home, do you see some of those spaces? Buying a house that you could theoretically improve upon and yes. yeah, put in more square footage, easily renovate to make yep. it more valuable. Yep. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, like uh, that's exactly right. And a lot of times people think about putting a second floor in a one level home that's not a good idea very because expensive. that's like very expensive um and then let's see for the investment side of it we'll just touch quickly on on this since because first time buyers i would encourage the, any first time buyers to buy the right home that's going to turn into an investment property down the road and with that in mind like cash flow how do you work with that um and i think that's like um, you have to kind of raise the income and then reduce the expenses, but that might be another talk. Um, I recommend like a Rich Dad Poor Dad Robert Kiyosaki book, which mm. which started me to think about these things. And I would start reading if I'm for some buyer about investing, so that by the time you are ready to become an investor, turning your first property into an investment property, your mindset will be there. Right. You know, if your mindset is not there, you'll probably sell a, you know, golden goose to someone else. Uh, yep. and that's how I see it as a first home. That's what I told my client that was, you know, thinking about selling wishes. And I was like, man, if mm -hmm. I could have that as an investment property, I would just take it right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like cash flow, like 
eight hundred bucks a month or something like that. Oh, you know, geez. there's like HOA yeah. taking care of the siting. It's um, you know, low low mortgage rate. So that I think there's a lot of people out there like that. Right? Yeah. yeah, it takes time though. Like people think about investing, it takes time. It takes God. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But the first home into an investment, you don't have to take that right off the bat. So you could just live there and then turn that into. So that's kind of important. The buying right in the beginning. Totally. Yeah. Um, it, what if someone wanted to contact you? Where Where's the good way? Where, where do we find you, Sean? Oh, uh, anywhere online. Just do a Sean Realty. Here, here's my logo right there. Okay. I don't know if you can zoom zoom in. Uh, zoom in. Uh, you you Google that. I'm the only Sean Realty show up uh, in the first page. I think Sean Realty with the S H A W N. Yeah, W N. Uh, it's a the website is Sean Dash Realty dot com. Phone number five one uh five one five four four nine nine. It's kind of really cheesy here, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, that that's my cell number. You can text me too. Um, I mean, if somebody watched until this far, I mean. We, we need to talk <laughs> because you're my people. Uh, uh, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on, Sean. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure, yeah. Stephen. Yeah. It's a really great episode. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.